I can't underscore enough um, the pandemic. I remember in 2003, I was working in Arizona and I went to a pandemic training by the Arizona Health Authority. And the gentleman that was giving the lecture just went on and on and on about all the things that could happen in a pandemic, that we wouldn't have a vaccine available, um, that it would cause mass job um, loss, that it would really have a huge recession in the economy. It was so overwhelming to think about. It sounded so abstract that I had a really hard time validating it. I just remember walking away from that training and I was like, well, that really won't happen. Um, and of course, we've learned that it absolutely will. So COVID has been really hard um, for us personally and professionally. Of course, that's caused economic downturn. We have the K recovery and that's been difficult. Here on the West Coast, we had wildfires this summer um, and we've lost a lot of communities, which was devastating, but we also had um, huge changes in our air quality. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that later, but that was really impactful to us given everything that's happened so far this year. We also um, have had social justice um, come up kind of at the forefront with George Floyd's death um, and all throughout the country, we've had different responses to that. And the reason I bring that up is that's hugely emotional. Um, and so that's added to the year and then we have this article from the New York Times that's up that talks about um, veterinary, the veterinary industry being a bright spot in the economy. And I can tell you that one of our surgeons was listening to a podcast when they talked about this article and it brought her to tears because the bright spot for the economy has been extraordinarily stressful for us as vet professionals. So, so what is surge capacity? And I found this very interesting. Um, surge capacity is our ability to rise to the occasion, and we usually see this in disasters. And so during emergency disasters, we have this physical response that helps us respond um, to what is going on around us, and we have the ability to do that in a very short period of time. I began reading about surge capacity after the West Coast fires. The air quality in Portland, where we're located, um, changed to hazardous and it brought us to our knees emotionally. Our, it was awful. And I think in another year, it would have been hard, but it wouldn't have, we would not have, have had the response that we did. And I read about surge capacity and found it really fascinating because what it said is, especially for the pandemic, we are deplete, we've depleted our ability to kind of rise the occasion. And that's because we have that emergency after emergency after emergency and our body can no longer respond to that. And so that's where we get this out loud, overwhelm sense um, where we feel defeated, um, where we feel like we can't handle one more thing. And again, I really saw this pretty clearly after um, the wildfires here on the West Coast. All right, so now we kind of understand why we're getting those emotional responses. Let's talk about what we can do about it. The first solution that I have is self-awareness. And I always love this meme. Um, <laughs> so um, I, the self-awareness I think is a um, really important thing um, for all of us um, to have and to take some time to reflect on who we are as people. And the reason I say that is because in times of stress, um, knowing who we are, that helps us fall back and be aware of how we respond and what to do next. So you'll see on this next slide, I actually use this slide quite often with our management team, um, and it's it's one of my favorites. So you can see on there, there's low emotional intelligence and high emotional intelligence, and they've broken down into four types. And those four types are based on the DISC profile. DISC is a personality inventory. We use it at Dove along with Myers-Briggs. Um, we like to use the work, work approaches inventory, and it kind of tells us how we navigate the work um, and puts people in different letters. I only explain that so you know where it's coming from. The reason I like to use this with our management team um, is I like, and, and people who are even coming to me with questions about communicating and stress, is that I like, I think it's really nice the way it kind of lays things out. And so I'm, I will tell you that I'm the red person. So in high emotional intelligence, or when things are going well, kind of I'm in my element, words to describe me are ambitious, strong-willed, and decisive. I like those words. Most people who know me, I think would agree with those words. I've never shown this slide and told people who I was and had anyone respond like, what, no way. Um, so I definitely think that's me and I feel good about that. 
But on the low emotional intelligence side, we have words like demanding, bossy, and confrontational. And I don't like those words. That's much, much dif more difficult for me to identify with. Um, when I look at those, I don't like them. I don't like to think of myself that way. But if I'm honest with myself, when I am in high times of high stress, and then when my emotional intelligence might be lessened, those are the words that are often who I am. And so the reason it's important for me to know that and to be able to be aware of it is so I can watch myself and take a moment to try to reset myself if that's what I'm feeling. And for me, I notice most quickly demanding. And I can, I can feel it as it's coming out of my mouth. <laughs> so when I'm very stressed, I begin to get very demanding. And I can tell by the, what I say out loud. And if I have a moment where I'm like, oh my gosh, that didn't come across the way I wanted it to, or a little sharper than I thought, I can take a step back, take a deep breath, and try to reset myself. I'm also really honest with my colleagues and my staff about this slide and who I am. And the reason I am is because if I am honest with them about who I am when I am not my best self, they can also help me by being aware of it too. So if I'm being demanding, it's okay for them to say, hey, you seem really stressed. And that can also be a cue to me, oh my gosh, time to take a deep breath, time to take a step back. And hopefully, by also telling them who I am when I'm not my best self, they can give me some compassion um, for when I might show up in a way that I wouldn't love. And again, it's okay for them to call me out on it, but being able to understand that I'm not being demanding for demanding sake, but more so that I am in a time of stress can be helpful. And that's why I think self-awareness is so important. If we don't know who we are, then there's no way for us to kind of self-correct ourselves. My next solution is to remember that anger is not anger. We talked quite a bit about this. Um, this is my dog, Porter, dressed as a turkey. So <laughs> I use like dog or turkey. You don't know who you are. Um, but anger is um, the same way, right? It presents itself. We can feel really defensive because someone's blaming us for someone or yelling at us or saying unkind things to us. Um, and that's hurtful. And our response is, of course, to defend ourselves or to be sharp back or to set some boundaries. But if we take a step and try to remember that they're not really angry, that they're sad or scared or disappointed or hurt, then I imagine you would have a different response. So think about that on both sides. Think about if someone came to you and said, I'm really scared, it would really be hard to be pretty defensive back. Similarly, when you're really scared, it might feel really brave, but to be able to say it out loud, will get you probably a lot of compassion from either your colleague or the person trying to help you. Or I'm disappointed. Or again, I'm, I'm fearful. Those are all really vulnerable words and why they feel scary to say it is an unusual person that might respond in a way that wasn't uncaring back. Solution three is to try to pinpoint the real problem. And this can be pretty hard when we're dealing with emotions. Um, sometimes our clients might come to us, for example, and maybe they're in the process of getting a divorce, and we don't know that, and then their pet's sick, and so they're left to just kind of yell at us. Um, so, um, and that's really hard, um, and we don't know that they're getting a divorce, and we're never gonna know that, right? There's just things that are happening in people's lives that change the way that they approach us, and we have no way to have any of that knowledge or to be able to, to solve that for them. We can't solve they're getting a divorce, we can't solve they lost their job, we can't solve anything like that. But what we can try to do, again, is remember, anger is not really anger. We can remember to try to listen. We can remember to try not to personalize as hard as that is. And we can try in that moment to try to hear what they are most upset about in that moment. Um, and that can give us a time that we can then um, help them try to problem solve um, if we can. And sometimes, as you can see on solution number four,